Alrighty, Shabbat Shalom. And Shabbat Shalom to those who are watching with us today. Uh, today we are going to be going over, it's uh, kind of part two. It's a different name to the message, but it's a part two of the message we did the last time on the tribes of Israel. And this one gets into a little bit deeper in certain promises that are given uh, to the tribes. So the name of the message is the birthright and the scepter. The birthright and the scepter. And you know, it's interesting when you look in scripture, and I always say this, find Yahweh's pattern and Yahweh's pattern never changes, right? But beside Yahweh's pattern, we also see other patterns in scripture. We see things that are going on, things that are happening. And one of the patterns we see uh, is a striving with brothers. You know, not necessarily every single time, but many times we see it, such as Cain and Abel, right? Ishmael and Isaac, Jacob and Esau, and Judah and Joseph, which we're going to talk about today. So uh, why is this striving happens? There's different reasons why it happens in different circumstances. But particularly the one we're going to go over mainly today is the striving between uh, the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Joseph, the two brothers that started because of these two promises, the birthright and the scepter promise. So uh, we'll go over first what these two are because birthright promise basically is the promise to the firstborn, right? When you look in a family, and even when Joseph's brothers came to him, remember they sell him into slavery. We'll go over that a little bit, not so much, but a little bit on that because of Judah's involvement. But then when they come and they're sitting before Joseph, what does it say? They all sat in order, judicial order, from the oldest to the youngest. So today, uh, in, especially in Western society, a lot of tradition and a lot of things have gone out the window. But this is something that's very important in the Bible is the birthright promise, the promise to the firstborn. The firstborn has a special promise there of preeminence and also double blessing, as we'll see. And then the promise of the scepter, right? What is the scepter? The scepter is the rod. The, so the promise of kingship. So that promise also goes uh, through certain tribe that's there. So we'll talk about these two promises, the birthright to Joseph, and the scepter to Judah. So let's start first with the scepter, just to show you what it is. Micah 5 in verse 2. Micah 5 in verse 2 says, And you, Bethlehem Ephrata, being least among the thousands of Judah, out of you he shall come forth to me to become one ruling in Israel, and his goings forth have been from old, from the days of eternity. Right? So where is... Uh, the Messiah coming out of. He's coming out of Bethlehem. He's coming out of Bethlehem is one of the tribes of Judah. And among the thousands of Judah, out of you shall come forth to me, the one being ruler in Israel. So that's the promise that's there, going back to the book of Micah, that the Messiah would come out of the book, would come out of the tribe of Judah. Uh, if we look in 2 Samuel 7, what we'll see is it's not just to Judah, but particularly to one person of the tribe of Judah, who was uh, King David. So 2 Samuel 7, in verse 11, I'm going to start just in the second part of the verse. It says, And Yahweh declares to you that Yahweh will make you a house. He's talking to King David now, and he's telling him what's going to happen. And when he says he'll make you a house, he's not just talking about uh, a physical sanctuary, which Solomon did make, but he's talking about a dynasty, a house being a dynasty, right? And he says, when your days are fulfilled and you lie with your fathers, then I shall raise up your seed after you, who shall come out from your loins, and I will establish his kingdom. And many people, particularly Jews, think this is talking about Solomon, right? But look what he says. He says, he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Did Yahweh establish the throne of King Solomon forever? No. Matter of fact, Solomon was the only king in that dynasty that was established there. As we'll see... Because of Solomon's sins, the kingdom was divided directly after Solomon. And only was it for David's sake, as Yahweh said, that he didn't do it during Solomon's life. So this is, this is a messianic prophecy. This is talking about the son of David, who, of course, became Yeshua and his eternal kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. We'll see that later in the message of the Messiah doing that. I shall be a father to him, and he will be a son to me, right? Who is the son of Elohim, the son of Yahweh, is Yeshua. If he takes iniquity upon himself, which Yeshua did, then I will chastise him with a rod of men, and Yahweh allowed that. 
and with strokes of the sons of men. But my mercy will not be taken from him as I took it from Saul, whom I removed from before you. And your house, he's talking to David now, his house is dynasty, right? His kingdom shall be sure, meaningly uh, it, it can't change, it's eternal. And your kingdom before me forever. Your throne will be established forever. So very, very clearly here we see uh, that even though there were problems during the reigns of the kings, and like I said, right after Solomon, Yahweh took the divided the kingdom there as we're going to see, and we went over in the last message, not going to go over too much of that today. But uh, what we see is, we see that as far as the scepter promise being to Judah, uh, there might be possibilities of it switching at a time, but overall it would stay with Judah forever because of, of King David and of course Yeshua, who also was the son of David, came from there. If we go to uh, Genesis 49 in verse 10, Genesis 49 verse 10, another messianic prophecy, the scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the lawmaker from between his feet until he to whom it belongs, until he comes to whom it belongs. Shiloh is the Hebrew word there, until Shiloh comes in the obedience of the people to him. So again, this is a messianic prophecy talking about the scepter not departing from Judah until the king comes, who it belongs to, who is Yeshua. So that's the scepter promise, and like I said, the scepter is, the promise was to Judah, and then through specifically to the line of David, and that's why even today any Jew knows the Messiah must be born as a son of David because there's many Jewish lines and many Jewish lineages, but it has to come through David. So how about the birthright now? Like we said, the birthright, it's the promise to the firstborn. And now even though, uh, I will say these promises Although they are eternal, the promise of the birthright and the promise of the scepter uh, are eternal promises. They'll never go away. They are conditional to people, though. So to the specific people that have these promises, you can lose these promises. And that's why we see the striving of brothers, right? When we're looking at Cain and Abel and Isaac and Ishmael and Jacob and Esau, particularly because Esau was the firstborn, but he gave up his birthright over to Jacob. So these promises can be lost through negligence, as we see with Esau, or sin, or other things. So, uh, you know, maybe that's a good message. Uh, I did it a long time ago that I could do again, the importance of, of the birthright holder, that we understand that, because today as Ephraimites, as we're going to see, each one of us is a first fruit. We're a birthright holder. So, it's a really important promise for inheritance and also preeminence in the family and like I say, the double blessing. So who is the birthright belong to? First Chronicles 5, First Chronicle 5, because was Joseph the oldest son? No. Reuben was the oldest son, but Reuben disqualified himself from the birthright, as we're going to see here. And the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, for he was the firstborn, but since he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given over to the sons of Joseph, the sons of Israel. And the genealogy is not to be counted according to the birthright. Right? For Judah prevailed among the, the, his brothers, and the chief ruler comes from him, but the birthright belongs to Joseph. So again, genealogy, as we know, if you look in Matthew 1 or Luke 4, the genealogy of Yeshua comes through what? It comes through the scepter promise. So it comes through Judah. But the birthright belongs to Joseph. Now, why Joseph's not the second oldest brother? Why when Reuben, Reuben uh, disqualified himself from the birthright, why didn't it go to the next born? Why did it go to Joseph? Because actually Joseph was the firstborn. Because the, the, the covenant that uh, Jacob made with Laban for his wife was for Raquel. It was not for Leah. And then we know what happened when the marriage came that uh, Laban switched the wives and he gave Leah over and said, well, she's the oldest and that's not the way it's done here. But that was never what was covenant with. That was never what was promised there. So technically, uh, really, the, the, the first wife and the covenant wife of Jacob was Rachel. And that's why when Reuben, who was his, his physical firstborn, was disqualified, the birthright promise went back to the original owner of it, who was uh, 
Joseph, because Joseph was the firstborn of Rachel, and then we know she died in childbirth when she was given birth to Benjamin. Uh, next year, we see if we go to Genesis 37, Genesis 37, the second verse, I'll just read the be beginning of it, and this is when uh, Joseph was being sold into slavery, what does it say? It says, these are the generations of Jacob. So these are his generations, meaning this is, this is the, he's going to tell who is the birthright holder. And he says, Joseph of Sinai, 17 years, was feeding the flock with his brothers. So the, the, the birthright holder, the firstborn of Jacob, clearly is Joseph. There's no doubt about that. We see it here. So how about some of the promises to the firstborn? Let's go to Deuteronomy 21 and verse 15. Because like I said, it's an extremely important blessing, the blessing of the firstborn. Deuteronomy 21 and verse 15. If a man has two wives, the one loved and the other hated, and they have borne him sons, both the loved ones and the hated ones, and the firstborn son was of her who was hated, then it shall be in the day that he causes his sons to inherit that which was his. He is not able to cause to inherit the firstborn son of the one loved before the firstborn of the one hated, who was truly the firstborn. So that's why I said it's not arbitrary. You simply can't pick because you like one son over another to give that son. Now granted, like I said before, and we see it in scripture, the firstborn can disqualify himself, and then the, the, you know, the other son would, be, uh, would take the firstborn promise, but you just can't arbitrarily take it away. He says, but he shall respect the firstborn the son of the hated one, by giving him a double portion of all that he has, for he is the first fruit of his strength, the right of the firstborn is his. So now we see a wild double blessing that comes in, right? And what does Ephraim mean, as we're going to see? Ephraim, because Ephraim has the right of the firstborn, as we're going to see as we go on here, we talked about this the last time, that Ephraim represents not just one tribe or the tribe of Joseph, but Ephraim will represent all of the northern tribes, and Ephraim actually means double double blessing, you know, double uh, fruitfulness. So that's an important blessing that comes, right? The right of the firstborn has the double portion preeminence. So now let's go to Genesis 48 and let's see how Ephraim becomes the firstborn holder because was Ephraim actually the firstborn? No, Manasseh was. But... Jacob, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, we're going to see what happens here. We're not sure what Manasseh did to disqualify himself, but uh, and he was also blessed the same way that Esau was still blessed, even though he disqualified himself. But Ephraim is going to be given the, fir the, the firstborn blessing and the right of the firstborn. So Genesis 48, we're going to start in verse 3. And Jacob said to Joseph, El Shaddai appeared to me in lust in the land of Canaan and blessed me. And said to me, Behold, I will make you fruitful and will multiply you and will give you a multitude of peoples. And I will give this land to your seed after you as a continual possession. And now your two sons, those born to you in the land of Egypt before my coming to you in Egypt are mine. Ephraim and Manasseh, like Reuben and Simeon, even they shall be mine. And I think most people don't understand this, what Jacob is saying, that literally he is adopting the two sons of Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh, to be his own. So they are literally becoming part of the 12 tribes of Israel. And that's why Joseph, who was the firstborn, who got the double blessing, he winds up having two sons now. So now there's not 12 tribes, there's 13 tribes. And we see even the allotment of the tribes, right? There's an allotment from Manasseh and there's an allotment for East Ephraim. And actually Manasseh's allotment was split half on the one side of the Jordan, half on the other side of the Jordan. But this is really important to understand now because they are literally now grafted in and adopted into the 12 tribes, which are now going to be 13 tribes because two tribes for Joseph. So now uh, drop down to verse 7. So that's the double blessing that Joseph is getting. Drop down to verse 7. We'll continue here. <clears throat> and I, when I came from Padan, Rachel died on me in the land of Canaan in the way, with only a little way to come to Ephrath. And I buried her there in the way to Ephrath, it being Bethlehem. And Israel saw the sons of Joseph, and he said, Who are these? And Joseph said to his father, They are my sons, whom Elohim has given to me here. And he said, Now bring them to me, and I will bless them. 
And the eyes of Israel were heavy from age, he not being able to see. And he brought them near to him, and he kissed them and embraced them. And Israel said to Joseph, I did not think to see your face. And behold, Elohim has caused me to see your seed. And Joseph brought them out from his knees, and he bowed his face to the earth. And Joseph took both of them, Ephraim in his right hand, to the left of Israel, and Manasseh in his left hand, to the right of Israel, and he brought them to him. And Israel sent forth his right hand and put it on the head of Ephraim, and he was younger. And he put his left hand on the head of Manasseh, crossing his hands, for Manasseh was the firstborn. And he blessed Joseph and said, The Elohim before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the Elohim who has fed me since I was born until today, the messenger that redeemed me from every evil, may he bless the youths, and may my name be called on them in the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac, and may they like fishes grow into a multiple multitude in the midst of the earth, right? So here it is, he's adopting them too, and now he's giving the blessing. And Joseph saw that his father was putting his right hand on the head of Ephraim, and it was evil in his eyes. And he, said, and he took hold of his father's hand to turn it from Ephraim's head to the head of Manasseh. And Joseph said to his father, not so my father, for this one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head, right? The right hand, because the right hand is the hand of strength. That goes to the firstborn. And look what he says. And his father refused and said, I know my son, I know. He also shall be a people and he shall become great. But his younger brother shall become greater than he and his seed, the seed of Ephraim, shall become the fullness of the nations. That's exactly how it says in the original Masoretic text, the original manuscripts of Scripture in the Hebrew. Uh, it's not always translated correctly in English, but this is the way it should be. His seed shall become the fullness of the nation. And why is this important? It's important because when we go to the book of Romans, Romans 11, in verse 25, because remember we said the last time, Romans 9, 10, 11 are all about what? It's all about the redemption of the tribes. And remember what it said in verse 15, if they're casting away the tribes is the reconciliation of the world. Remember we said that? By them going out in diaspora, it gave opportunity for salvation to the whole world because as the disciples and the apostles would go all around the world seeking the sons of Israel, anybody of any race or creed can join the new covenant. What will their restoration be except life from the dead? And here we are in the last generation and the tribes are being restored and we're for the first time in thousands of years understanding that we are Ephraimites and Israelites and now we know that means the resurrection is going to happen. And even more proof here because he says in verse 25, For I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers. So this is a mystery, right? This is something that the Holy Spirit has to reveal. It's not something that is just going to be that evident. This is the mystery. He doesn't want us to be ignorant, brothers, so that you may not be wise within yourself. That hardness, in part, has happened to Israel until the fullness of the nations comes in. And who did we just say the fullness of the nations was? Ephraim. Ephraim will be the fullness of the nations. So all the tribes of Israel will be saved. As it has been written, the deliverer will come out of Mount Zion. He who turned away iniquity from Jacob. So all... Israel, and that's the whole point of Romans 9, 10, and 11. Has Yahweh rejected his people Israel? And the Apostle Paul is saying, no, I'm an Israelite myself from the tribe of Benjamin, not from the tribe of Judah. So it's really interesting here as we're seeing now, as we're getting into the promise of the birthright and the promise of the scepter, that that birthright promised to Joseph, and now at the end of days, and, and I'm not going to go over again today, we went over the last time, where the tribes went to, right? They went to Africa, they went to... Uh, the Parthian Empire and all around Iraq and Iran and the uh, Caspian Sea and the Black Sea and all those areas there. And then they wound up coming to Europe and then uh, eventually from Europe to Great Britain and then to the United States. And basically they're all over the world today, right? Even today in Afghanistan and uh, these different places, there's literally tribes who can show that they are Israelites. They have graves and they have and sometimes even... Uh, stones and tombstones and different things, menorahs that are thousands of years old showing their Israelite heritage. So uh, it is an amazing mystery that in the end time, 
most of us who came out of Christianity who thought we were Gentiles, right? Like I said, a Gentile is a non-believer. A Gentile is a heathen. So you can't be a believer in Yahweh and be a Gentile. But now we're finding out that we're not just uh, adopted into the family of Yahweh, but we're literally Israelites by heritage, you know, coming in. So it's, it's an amazing plan of Yahweh. You know, it's an amazing plan of Yahweh that, like I said, he's not a respective person and any Gentile anywhere in the world can be grafted into the one tree, but it clearly shows that he never gave up on the nation of Israel, as we see from the book of Hosea, which we'll get into a little later in the message too. So, wow, how awesome is that, right? So, like I said in the other message, when we say the, 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 the term Ephraimite, you know, from the Ephraim, we're from Ephraim, we're not saying that we are literally from the tribe of Ephraim, but Ephraim means all the ten tribes, as we'll see here in the next verse. Let's go down to 1 Kings 11 and verse 26. 1 Kings 11 and verse 26. Because since Ephraim is the firstborn, uh, like I said, whether you're from Asher or Zebulon or uh, any of the tribes that are there, Simeon, Ephraim is the head tribe, so when you say the tribe of Ephraim, you're talking about the ten tribes to the north, and Judah still kept the southern kingdom of Judah and Benjamin. Only for David's sake, certainly not for Solomon's, who did many, many things. He married many foreign wives. He uh, worshipped pagan deities, and Yahweh had to turn away from him later in his life, and it was very, very sad for that to happen. But that's what caused the split in the kingdom, of which one of the main things the Messiah does is bring that split together. We talked about that the last time. We'll talk about it later in the message today also. So 1 Kings 11 and verse 26. And Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, an Ephraimite, Ephrathite of Zereda, a servant of Solomon, and his mother's name was Zerula, a widow woman. He also lifted up a hand against the king. So this is what happens, right? That Yahweh makes a... Uh, an adversary to Solomon and it's Jeroboam who comes from the tribe of Ephraim. And this was the thing in which he lifted up his hand against the king. Solomon built Milo and closed up the breaks of the city of his father David. And the man Jeroboam was a mighty warrior. And Solomon saw the young man that he was doing work. And he appointed him to all the burden of the house of Joseph. Why? Because that's where he comes from. Because he's, he's an Ephraimite. So he was appointed the burden to his forefather Joseph. And at that time it happened that Jeroboam had gone out from Jerusalem, and Ahijah the, the Shilonite, the prophet, found him in the way, and he discovered himself with a new garment, and both of them were themselves in the field. And Ahijah, Ahijah laid hold of the new garment on him and tore it in twelve pieces. We talked about that the last time, talk, showing about the new covenant. I'm not going to talk about that again today. I just want to briefly go over. And he says to Jeroboam, Take ten pieces for yourself. For so says Yahweh Elohim of Israel, Behold, I am tearing the kingdom from the hand of Solomon and giving it to you, the ten tribes, right? This is Ephraim to the north, Judah to the south. Ephraim having the birthright prop, uh, promise, Judah still having the scepter promise. And he shall have the one tribe for my servant David's sake, talking about Solomon, and for Jerusalem's sake, the city which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel. Because they have forsaken me and bowed themselves to uh, Asherah, the goddess of the Sidonians, to Chemosh, the god of Moab, and to Milcom, the god of the sons of Ammon, and have not walked in my ways to do the right in my eyes and my statutes and my judgments, as his father David did. So these are real bad things that Solomon did. But I will not take the whole kingdom out of his hand, but I will make him ruler all the days of his life for my servant David's sake, whom I chose because he kept my commandments and my statutes, right? Because for David it's an everlasting kingdom. And I will take the kingdom out of his son's hands and will give it to you, the ten tribes. And I will give one tribe to his son, that there may be a lamb to my servant David before me all the days in Jerusalem, the city that I have chosen to myself to put my name there. And that's why Solomon's son Rehoboam took over in the southern kingdom. And I will take you and you shall reign according to all that your soul desires, and you shall be king over Israel. And it will be if you will hear all that I command, and you shall walk in my ways and do what that is right in my eyes to keep my statutes and my commandments as my servant David did. Then I shall be with you and shall build a sure house for you. He's giving the same promise to Jeroboam as he gave to David. 
As I built for David and shall give Israel to you, and for this I will afflict the seed of David, but not forever. And did Jeroboam listen? No. Matter of fact, just about every king after Jeroboam, when Yahweh is correcting him, what does he say? That you did not listen as your father Jeroboam. He's mentioned a lot, but never in a good light was Jeroboam mentioned. So, wow. And this is what we're going to see. We're going to see that in both cases, whether it was Judah striving for the birthright promise or Ephraim striving for the scepter promise, there was, there was a vexation going on with the, with, with the two tribes, the brothers, right? Because each going after his own. But Jeroboam had an opportunity here, an amazing opportunity, if he would have been faithful, but he wasn't. He did the same as Solomon. And he saw why he was ripped away from Solomon for his pagan worship. And he did the same thing. And a matter of fact, in Israel today, we go there many, many, many times. I've probably been there a hundred times and tell Dan, uh, they still have the altar from Jeroboam. And you could see, he wasn't doing sacrifices to Yahweh there. He, was, he put the, the uh, golden, uh, little golden calf that he had up there. And he was, you know, doing worship to uh, pagan deities from there. So, we see what happens. And then, if we go to Jer uh, back to Genesis 37. Back to Genesis 37. And this is when Joseph is being sold into slavery. Who is the one, who's the main one, who is over trying to get rid of Joseph? Genesis 37 and verse 26. And Judah said to his brothers, What gain is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. And do not let our hands be on him, for he is our brother, our flesh. And his brothers listened. And men, Midianites, traitors, passed. And they drew up and took Joseph out of the pit. And they sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they brought Joseph into Egypt. So isn't that kind of interesting? That uh, the same way Ishmael and uh, Isaac were fighting over the right of the firstborn, Judah, who has the right of the scepter, what does he do? He sells Joseph, and then he's thinking that he'll have the right of the firstborn. I'm not going to go into it, but then the next chapter, that's why when Judah's evil sons died, he was trying to get uh, the seed to Tamor, the, the wife of his first son, so she could have seed because he was trying to take over the birthright promise that was here. And these are big promises. I mean, these are promises, like I said, they started out as families, right? The family of Abraham, the family of Isaac, the family of Jacob or Yaakov. But they became nations and kingdoms and kings, like he said, will come out of your loins. So these are important promises. And we see the striving of both Judah now trying to get the promise of the, the firstborn, selling Joseph into slavery. And then, like I said, we see uh, Jeroboam, having the right to possibly get the promise of the scepter away from Judah. So this is the striving that has been going on through all time and even still going on today. There's still a striving between Judah and Ephraim. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But uh, actually the first time you see the word Jew in Scripture, the Jews are fighting with Israel. So that's the striving to come. 2 Kings 16, 5 and 6. 2 Kings 16. Five and six. Then Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Ramallah, the king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem to war, and they besieged Ahaz, but they were not able to fight. And at that time, Rezin, the king of Syria, brought Eloth back to Syria and threw the Jews out of Eloth. Right? So that's the first time you see the word Jew there, and what's happening? The Jews are fighting with Israel. <laughs> Judah is fighting with Israel. That's there. So this is the vexation that's going on. If we go to Zechariah 11 and verse 10, this goes all the way up until the time of the Messiah. So Zechariah 11. Zechariah, really, really interesting prophetic book about so many different things going all the way to the end time. But here, he's talking about the, the vexation that's happening between Judah and Ephraim all the way going to the Messiah and then look what happens here. Zechariah 11, verse 10. And I took my staff grace and broke it apart to break my covenant, which I had cut with all the people. Right? This is where the first covenant is ending and the new covenant is starting. 
And it was broken in that day, and so the poor of the flock who were watching me knew it was from the word of Yahweh. And I said to them, if it is good in your eyes, give my price, and if not, let it go. And they weighed my price 30 pieces of silver, right? So we just saw Joseph being sold for 20 pieces of silver to get the birthright promise. Here is the prophecy of Yeshua being sold for 30 pieces of silver to finish the first covenant, right? And this is what's happening. And Yahweh said to me, throw it to the potter, the splendid price at which I was valued by them. And I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw it to the potter in the house of Yahweh. Well, and this is exactly what Judas did after he sold Yeshua out and he got the money and he threw it to the potter for potter's field. But why is this important? Because Yeshua was actually the last sacrifice in the, the temple that Yahweh sanctioned. And literally the money that came to pay Judas off when they got Yeshua was money that came from the temple treasury that was paid for sacrifices. That's what they used the money for. So they used that 30 pieces of silver for the last sacrifice that Yahweh sanctioned was the sacrifice of Yeshua. And then look what happened when that happened. It says, then I broke apart my second staff union that I might break the brotherhood between Judah and Israel, right? So now, John 1, 11, he came to his own, his own rejected him. And what happened from there? We went over this in the last lesson. Did he go to Gentiles? No. Yeshua said, don't go to the Gentiles, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And that's who he sent his disciples after. So this is what's happening here is he broke apart as the, 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 the staff, as, as the new covenant started, the covenant of grace, and Judah rejected it outright. He went to the tribes of Ephraim, the other tribes of Israel, and the brotherhood between Judah and Israel was broke from there. So we never see it again. Judah goes into captivity, right, from that time when the Romans came in and they get dispersed throughout the world. And the tribes of Ephraim are dispersed in another way, and they never came together. So as the Father used the congregation of Yeshua to pull the tribes of Israel back throughout the last 2,000 years, the tribes of Judah are not part of that. The tribes of Judah, and it's really interesting because when a Messianic Jew, uh, someone from the tribe of Judah, comes to faith in Yeshua now, they're actually grafted into the new covenant, which is the covenant with Ephraim. Judah is the only tribe that's not in that covenant right now. Now we do know from Zechariah 12 and verse 10, it's right here, I will pour out my, my spirit in the end time, the time we're living in now, very shortly. Yahweh says, I'll pour on the house of David and on those living in Jerusalem the spirit of grace and prayers, and they shall look on me whom they pierce when Yeshua returns, and they see the holes in his hands and the holes in his side and his feet. And they will look on me whom they pierce, and they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. And they shall be bitter over him like the bitterness over the firstborn, right? Because Yeshua, as we're going to see, comes back and he has both the right of the firstborn and the right of the scepter. He has both promises. So when he returns, there's no reason anymore for the striving between brothers. But up until now, there still is a striving. Because now the tribe of Ephraim and the northern tribes, we've all accepted Yeshua as the Messiah. And we've accepted the new covenant and we're part of it. But Judah still does not accept it. And that's why over the last 2,000 years, there's been such this friction between Jews and believers. You know, not made by believers, but made by Jews. And even where many Jews in the first century and second century, I mean, totally killed many believers and had them killed because of this, because of their rejection of Yeshua. And the evil things they write about Yeshua and the Talmud and the mission and these different things. And then what happens? Satan uses false Christianity that he makes, right, through Constantine in the 4th century, this false Christianity that he made, this new religion of Christianity that's not the Christian uh, religion that you see in the book of Acts, but it's totally different now. It's a Christianity made by Constantine the Great, the Emperor of Rome, and through the years all the way going up to Hitler, they use in the name of Christianity, they persecute Jews, and they have all these programs against Jews. And never, though, were true believers involved in any of that because it was the true believers that were also persecuted. If you look at the time in the wilderness and read my book, The Gates of Hell Will Not Prevail Against Her, and whether you look at the Boletians or the Waldenses or the, the Insabitai or the Albigenses, the uh, Anabaptists, they were all persecuted by that same false Christian religion that persecuted our brother Judah too. So at the end of days, now Yahweh is calling it though all back together. And that's what makes it so exciting. So let's get into the prophetic side of this now, because there's no reason anymore for us to fight over these promises. 
the promises of the birthright, the promises of the scepter, because the Messiah comes who has both of those promises, and all of us are under his subjection. Habakkuk 1 and verse 5, the book of Habakkuk, back up to Habakkuk, says, Look among the nations and behold and be amazed. Be amazed, for a work is working in your days which you would not believe if I told it to you. So Yahweh is saying this great work that's in the end time. Why? Because he's going to do two things in the last generation. He's going to make two nations. He's going to make a physical nation of Israel again, which he has, right? Since 1948, the Jews are back in the land of Israel, and they're, they're the caretakers now, or brother Judah, are over the land, and they're there since 1948. And he's also going to make a spiritual nation, a spiritual nation of Israelites throughout all the world, and that's what we are. We are the outcasts of Israel. So our brother Judah will not allow us right now into the land, right, as a whole of Ephraimites to live there. But we are a spiritual nation, so we don't need their permission. When the time is right, Yahweh will bring, as we'll see, he'll bring back because the promise in the end time is all 12 tribes will come back to the land. But in order for us to do that, we need the Messiah. We need the Messiah to come back because he is our authority. And when he does come back, our brother Judah will accept him. And then we're going to see at the end, like we read the last time, he'll take the two sticks together and he'll put them together and we'll be one again. So it's really interesting, the time we're living in. This is the great work. Because you could see both. How can anybody deny it? You read the scriptures, and all the scriptures say all 12 tribes will be redeemed, New Testament and uh, the Tanakh. And then what do we see? We see that the Jews are literally in the nation of Israel again. They're a nation again. You can't deny it because they're there. And you see the spiritual nation of Ephraimites all over the world. So wow, talk about proof that we see there. Romans 11, 1 and 2, because the Apostle Paul talked about this. He says... I say then, did not Yahweh thrust away his people? Let it not be, for I am also an Israelite out of Abraham's seed of the tribe of Benjamin. Yahweh did not thrust away his people who he foreknew, right? So this is Yahweh's promise to us as Ephraimites that you don't have to worry. Uh, it's like, like I said, the wilderness. We've talked many, many times about the wilderness in recent times, in recent years. But what was one of the promises, one of the things you had to do in the wilderness? You couldn't make a life because you never knew when the cloud was moving. And it's the same now. As Ephraimites living in diaspora, we have to be careful because, yes, we can set up communities and we can set up kibbutzes and we can make temporary dwellings there, but they're not permanent. And we have to be ready for the day that Yahweh will pick us up and take us maybe through Jordan first, right? And Selah, the place of the rock, but then eventually over to Mount Zion in Israel. So that is, this is where we don't want to lose our focus on this. And if we go to Amos uh, 9 and 14 and 15, he says, And I will bring back the captivity of my people Israel, and they will build the way cities and live in them, and they shall plant vineyards and drink the wine of them. They shall also make gardens and eat the fruit of them. And I will plant them on their land, and they will never again be pulled out of their land, which I have given to them, says Yahweh your Elohim. So it's prophesied. It's prophesied to happen and I'm showing you both sides of it. I'm showing you the prophecy of it, and I'm showing you the fulfillment of it that we're living in. <laughs> the fact that we have, like I said, uh, close to 8 million of our brother Judah living in the land of Israel today, and I, I can't tell you how many millions, probably close to a billion Israelites around the world, and how many, though, first fruits are understanding who they really are and coming to faith in Yeshua. Uh, Jeremiah 31 and verse 1. Jeremiah 31 and verse 1. Because this is one of the most exciting things you'll ever see in prophecy. The whole thing of the redemption of the tribes of Israel. And it all stems around these promises of Yahweh because the promises of the birthright, the promises of the scepter can't change. Like I said, individuals can disqualify themselves, but the promise itself is eternal. It won't change so Jeremiah 31, starting in verse 1. At that time, and this is again, it, oh, we say this in end time idiom, whenever it says in that day and at that time, it's an end time idiom, that's, and it says Yahweh, at that time says Yahweh, I will be the Elohim of all the families of Israel and they will be my people. Not just one tribe, not just two tribes, but all the tribes. So says Yahweh, Israel, the people, the survivors of the sword have found grace, where they found it? In the wilderness. 
Like I said, there's one road to the promised land and that's through the wilderness. And the quicker you get there, the quicker you're gonna, the Holy Spirit will work from you and will transform you and your mind will be there. And then the quicker you'll get to the promised land. I will go to give rest to him. Yahweh has appeared to me from far away saying, yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. On account of this, with loving kindness, I have drawn you, right? And Yahweh loves his people. He loves his people and, and, and from all the tribes and he's never given up on them. And I will build you and you shall be built again, O virgin of Israel. You will again put on your tambourines and go forth in the dance of making merry, right? That's why we do the Hebrew dancing for the last 20 something years because we are doing this in fulfillment of this scripture. You shall yet plant vineyards in the mountains of Samaria. The planters will plant and shall treat as common. For there will be a day when the watchmen on the hills of Ephraim shall call out, Arise and let us go up to Mount Zion, to Yahweh our Elohim. And that's what we're waiting for. We're waiting for the Maliks of Yahweh uh, to call us when Yeshua returns and call all the tribes in Diaspora back to the promised land for this. Drop down to verse 9. They will come with weeping and I will lead them with prayers. I will cause them to walk by rivers of water in a right way. They will not stumble in it, for I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim, Ephraim is my firstborn. Wow, is the right of firstborn important? You better believe it is. And this is what Yahweh's saying here. He's not going to leave us out. We're the firstborn. He's not going to do this plan. He's not going to fulfill all his prophecy and forget about his firstborn. Of course not. He is a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Hear the word of Yahweh, O nations, and declare in the coastlands far away. And say, he who scattered Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd his flock. And that's why, praise Yahweh, I've been doing this for the last uh, 25 years, going all over the earth and proclaiming these promises that Yahweh says in Scripture, and then being there in Israel to actually be a fulfillment of it and be able to show the people the, the truth of this is just amazing because prophecy cannot be broken. Wow. So Ephraim is Yahweh's firstborn. Only Judah has returned, and the other tribes will be returning after that. If we go to Zechariah 12, go to Zechariah 12 and verse 4. Because there's a reason why he took Judah back to the land first. Uh, number one, because they're still in unbelief, in, in unbelief. So he had to physically have them there if he's going to transform the people for us. Who are, who, who are part of the spiritual nation that Yahweh has all over the earth. Uh, we don't need that. We don't need uh, a physical nation at this point to believe the promises that we will eternally reign with Yeshua from Mount Zion. But Judah, because they're still in unbelief, they do. So let's go to verse 4 of Zechariah. Zechariah 12. It says, In that day I will strike every horse with panic and his rider with madness, says Yahweh. And I will open my eyes on the house of Judah, and I will strike every horse of the people with blindness, right? And Judah has been blind up to this point. And the leaders of Judah, those living in Jerusalem, shall say in their heart, And Yahweh of hosts shall be my strength and their Elohim. This is the great repentance that's going to come. And in that day I will make the leaders of Judah like a hearth of fire among the wood, and like a torch of fire among cut grain. And they shall devour all the people around on the right and on the left. And Jerusalem will be inhabited in her place again in Jerusalem, right? So, wow, this is unbelievable because during the days of Israel being a nation, Judah was never a mighty kingdom except for the days of, of King David and, the, and, and Solomon. Judah was always weak and that's why they're making alliances with Egypt and they're making alliances with Babylon. And they're making alliances with Syria. Whoever they can make an alliance with because they were weak. And here, Yahweh's saying in the end time, when they come back, they're going to be one of the strongest nations on earth, and they are. They're maybe now the fifth or sixth uh, most powerful military on the earth, when they're one of the newest nations and smallest nations on earth. How could that be? Because the prophecy says it. And why did Yahweh do it? Because of verse 7. Yahweh also shall save the tents of Judah first. So that the glory of the house of David and the glory of those living in Jerusalem may not be magnified above Judah. So why did he bring Judah back first? Because of David. And that's why the tabernacle of David has come out. To show the promises to David and to show that David believed in Yeshua. David believed in Melchizedek who was Yeshua. It's just a title you know, for the king of 
righteousness and the king of peace. And Psalm 110, right? Yahweh said to my Adonai. Yahweh said to my Adonai. Who was David's Adonai? Yeshua? <laughs> so David knew him. He believed in him. And he's, he's the, 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 the king, you know, the king of Judah forever, his lineage. And like I said, when Yeshua returns and David is resurrected, all the people of Judah will understand it. And then we will be one again. Isaiah 11 and verse 10. And then what's going to happen? The vexation that we've seen all the way going back to King Solomon will be gone. Isaiah 11 and verse 10, It shall be in that day the root of Jesse stands as a banner for his people. What does that mean whenever you see that? The root of Jesse, the root, is the, it's a messianic scripture talking about the banner, meaning all the 12 tribes, they each have a banner. Nation shall seek to him, and his resting place will be glorious. Verse 13, And the envy of Ephraim shall turn off, and Judah's foes shall be cut off. Ephraim will not envy Judah, and Judah shall not trouble Ephraim. So this is what's happening, this this, this vexation that has gone on for uh, each one trying to take the other one's promise of the birthright or the scepter will be over. There's no need for that anymore because in the Messianic kingdom, Yeshua has the right to both the birthright and the scepter. And as believers under him, we have the right to both of them too because it's his birthright and it's his scepter. Zechariah 6 and verse 12. Zechariah 6 and verse 12. So it says it. He says, And speak to him, saying, So says Yahweh of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is the branch. What is he talking? He's talking about from, from the branch, you know, of, of Jesse. He's talking about the from, from the root of Jesse. This is coming from the prophecy from Isaiah 11 here, talking about the man whose name is the branch, because he is the branch. He is the one. He is coming out from that stump of Jesse. That's the branch who is going to be the Messiah. So that's what he's saying. The man whose name is the branch, he shall spring up out of his place, and he will build the sanctuary of Yahweh, just like we read in 2 Samuel 7. Even he will build the sanctuary of Yahweh, and he will bear the majesty, and he will sit and rule on his throne, and he shall be a priest on his throne, and the council of peace will be between the two of them, right? It will be between the two of them, between uh, king and priest, between the birthright and the scepter, between these two promises. And that's why I always say, in Israel, where the temple was, you have two hills that are there. You have the Akra, which is one hill, right? That's where King David's palace was. And then you have the second hill, which was called Ophel. That's where the sanctuary of Yahweh was built. And there was a little uh, valley in between that was called Milo. And Solomon built up the Milo and made them into one. And that's why Psalm 122 says, you know, that Jerusalem is a city built unto itself. He made them into one. So now that's what he's saying from this scripture, that the king and the priest, the birthright and the scepter, the two will be one because Yeshua as king of the universe and creator of all things, he owns both of them. And then Judah and Ephraim will be one again. Judah will be come into the new covenant and all tribes will be peace at that time. How amazing is it, huh? How amazing that this is, and just think how close we are to it. Got to get through this last little rough time that we're going through, and it's going to get rougher before it gets better. But like I said, we've read the end of the book. We know we win. We know that Yahweh has sent it for his people, and we know that Yeshua is coming very soon, and we know we just need to overcome and endure to the end, and then we will be part of this. We will be part of the solution, right, of bringing this good news all throughout all the world. Jeremiah 50, 19 and 20. Jeremiah 50 and verse 19 and 20. He says, And I will again bring Israel to his home, and he will feed on Carmel and Bashan, and his soul shall be satisfied on Mount Ephraim and Mount Gilead. In those days and at that time, again, so this is end time, states Yahweh, the iniquity of Israel will be sought for, and it is not, and the sins of Judah, and they will not be found. For I will pardon those whom I leave as a remnant. So, you know, you look at Israel today and it's not in a good shape. Like I said, there's getting close to 8 million uh, Jews that are living there. But uh, the nation is really bad. Jerusalem is a defiled place. The sin that's going on there. But in Zechariah, Zechariah 13, he tells us two-thirds of the people are going to be wiped right out 
uh, during the war that's coming there very soon when Yahweh chastises them. So that's, that's a big number, two-thirds of the people. And then the last third is going to go through the purification of fire. So when Yeshua returns, there's not many people that are left there, but there is a remnant in Judah. And we know, we know from Revelation 11, where it talks about the two witnesses, and it says when they're crucified in Jerusalem, that there's a great earthquake and 7,000 people die, which is one-tenth of the city. So do your math. That means there's 70,000 people in Jerusalem at that time. Today, there's over a million. So that means, wow, 90% or more of the people will be dead by the time that that happens. So, so uh, when we're looking at this, it's, it's good news, you know, that Judah is going to come into the new covenant and good news that there will be a remnant and all 12 tribes will be saved, like it says in Romans 11. But it is sad to think of how many people are going to have to suffer and die for that to happen. And not just in Israel, but all over the world. All over the world. I mean, there's, in the world today, you know, there's uh, roughly 8 billion people. Kind of interesting, right? 8 million in Israel, 8 billion in the world. And the same numbers that are coming, you know. Worldwide, 95% or more of the people living in the world today will be not there, they'll be dead by the time Yeshua returns. And just read the book of Revelation, it talks about that. It talks about the same thing. You know, how many people are going to die to that point. We go to Hosea 1. Let's go back to the book of Hosea. Hosea 1. And verse 7. He says, I will have mercy on the house of Judah and will save them by Yahweh their Elohim. And I will not save them by bow or by sword or by battle or by horses or by horsemen. So again... No doubt about it, Judah is going to be saved. They are going to accept Yeshua. They are going to come into the New Covenant. And then we know from Daniel 12, all the Israelites that were living in Israel before Yeshua came, that never had the opportunity to make that choice, will be resurrected. They'll be resurrected flesh and blood. We're going to read shortly Ezekiel 37. We're going to read the second part of it, but the beginning part talks about that great resurrection of all the Israelites to a physical resurrection. And then the part we're going to read is about Yeshua taking the two sticks and making them one. So we see here again that there is redemption for our brother Judah. And then drop down to uh, verse 10. He says, Yet the number of the sons of Israel will be as the sand of the sea, which is not measured nor numbered. And it will be in the place where it was said to him, You are not my people. It will be said, Sons of the living Elohim. So again, this is exactly what Paul quoted in Romans 9, 25 and 26, when he's talking about the redemption of the tribes, right? So what's interesting about this, though, is this is how we know he's talking to the tribes of Ephraim in Romans 9, 10, 11. Like I said, there's, there's no greater proof in the New Testament that everything I've been talking about in these last two messages about the tribes of Israel is true than Romans 9, 10, 11. It actually sums it all up in those three chapters. But the interesting part is that over here, where he's saying, although the sons of Israel will be at the sands of the sea, which they are, like I said, if you look at the diaspora where they went around the world, there's probably a billion Israelites on the earth today, or more, and yet only a small remnant of first fruits. How many true believers are there? Not many, you know, might be several hundred thousand, maybe, who knows, you know, maybe up to a million when you add in all the Laodiceans, but it's not a large number compared to how many Israelites are. But what's interesting here is that in John 21, 11, I'm not going to go there, but that's where Yeshua, after he's resurrected and he uh, meets the disciples on the Sea of Galilee and he's cooking fish with them, right? And he tells them to throw out their net and when do they come out? And he says they catch the fish 153. Why would Yahweh name that? Everything in scripture has purpose. So why would he name specifically how many fish were caught? Before that, when Yeshua first met Peter, right, and Andrew, it said their, their nets were breaking, but it never said how many fish were caught at that time. This time it says exactly 153 because in Hebrew originally, there were no numbers, right? Numbers today, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. There were letters that represented numbers. It was by the alphabet. The Aleph was 1, the Bet was 2, the Gimel was 3, all the way down through 1 through 9, and then 10 through 100, and then 200, 300, 400. 22 letters all the way up to 400 it goes. 
So if you look at any word in Hebrew, it has a num uh, uh, numeral value. Well, when you look at John 21, 11, where he says they caught 153 fish, if you look at the value where he says, he said to them, you are not my people, it will be said to them, sons of the living El, or the living Elohim. The gematri, the number value for sons of the living Elohim is 153. Wow. So that is, because it's a very interesting number too. When you play with that number uh, with algebra, it's a very, very interesting number, 153. But here it is. It's, it's actually the, the number of this scripture, again, showing that Yahweh has a remnant of Ephraim, a remnant of Israelites. So it's absolutely amazing uh, to see this. Zechariah 10 and verse 6. Back to Zechariah. Zechariah 10 and verse 6. He says, and I will make stronger the house of Judah, and I will save the house of Joseph, right? Both houses together. And I will return to save them. For I have pity on them, and they shall be as though I had not cast them off. For I am Yahweh their Elohim, and I will answer them. And Ephraim will be like a mighty one, and their heart shall be glad as by wine. And their sons will see and be glad, their heart shall rejoice in Yahweh. And I will whistle for them and gather them. For I have redeemed them, and they shall be many as they were many. And I will sow them among the people, and they shall remember me in far countries, and they shall live with their sons in return. And I will return to save them out of the land of Egypt, and gather them out of Assyria. And I will bring them into the land of Gilead and Lebanon, for room shall not be found for them. Wow. So here we see, I mean again, the tribe of Judah, the tribe of Ephraim, which is all the tribes together. Again, they're just representing all 12 tribes will all be there in the land and the brotherhood will be back. The brotherhood that was broken at that time, uh, you know, through the vexation that happened and going all the way back to uh, Joseph and his brothers in scripture and Joseph being a type of Messiah in the same way that Joseph forgave his brothers where they didn't recognize him and then when they recognized him, he forgave them, right? It's the same way with Yeshua. He forgives, and that's the great part of the new covenant, and he will recognize them. So let's go to a couple more scriptures. We'll be finished. Let's go to Ezekiel 37 and verse 15. We went through the last time, but it's important. This is an extremely important scripture. <coughs> Ezekiel 37. And like I said, if you look at the beginning of the chapter, it's an amazing chapter. The first verse, the hand of Yahweh was on me and he brought me by the spirit of Yahweh and made me rest in the midst of the valley and it was full of bones, right? Who are these bones? The bones are very dry, verse 2. And he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? And I said, Adonai Yahweh, you know. And he said, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of Yahweh. And, Yah and so Adonai Yahweh said to these bones, behold, I will make breath to enter into you and you will live. And then he asks, who are these bones? And he tells him, they are the whole house of Israel, right? Verse 11. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are all the house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried, our hope is perished. We are cut off to ourselves. Why? Because they died without Messiah. So this is a physical resurrection that's coming when Yeshua returns. And then what happens? What happens? Go down to verse 15. And the word of Yahweh was to me saying, And you, son of man, take one stick for yourself and write in it for Judah and his companions, the sons of Israel. Remember, Benjamin joined him. And a few of the other, uh, uh, some people from the tribes came down. So anyone who ever lived in Judah is in one hand. And take another stick and write in it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim and all the house of Israel, his companions, right? So this is Ephraim and the other nine tribes all together and draw them into one to yourself bring them into one stick one ikad unified and they shall become unified in your hand my book the chosen people you know you see that and when the sons of your people shall speak to you saying will you not declare to us what this means say to them so says Adonai Yahweh behold I will take the stick of Joseph which is in the hand of Ephraim and the tribes of Israel, his companions, and I will put them with him with the stick of Judah, and I will make them one stick, and they shall be one in my hand. They will be cod, unified. 
And the stick shall be in your hand, the ones in which you write before their eyes. And say to them, So says Adonai Yahweh, Behold, I will take the sons of Israel from among the nations, there where they've gone, and I will gather them all around and will bring them into their own land. And I will make them one unified nation in the land on the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king to all of them. And they shall not be two nations anymore, and they shall not be split into two kingdoms anymore. And they shall not still be defiled by their idols, even with their filthy idols, nor with all their transgressions. But I will save them out of their dwelling places where they have sinned in them, and I will cleanse them so that they shall be a people to me, and I will be Elohim for you. So here it is, Judah is going to repent for denying Yeshua and the idolatry that they went into with the rabbis and all that stuff. And all of us who came from the Ephraimites, who came from Christianity and all the paganism that was in Christianity, we've repented of all that and we're coming back to Yahweh's Torah. So this way we could be one together, serving him according to the Tanakh in honesty and truth. And my servant David will be king over them, right? And they will be one shepherd. There will be one shepherd to all of them, Yeshua. And they shall walk in my judgments and keep my statutes and do them. And they will dwell on the land I gave to my servant, to Jacob, there where your fathers dwelt in it. And they shall dwell on it, they and their sons in there, and the sons of their sons forever. And my servant David will be a ruler to them forever. And I will cut a covenant of peace with them, an everlasting covenant, right? Melchizedek, Melchizedek, the, the king of righteousness, the king of peace. Where is he? From Salem, from peace. And I will cut a covenant of peace with them, an everlasting covenant will be with them. And I will place them and multiply them, and I will put my sanctuary in their midst forever. And my tabernacle shall be with them, and I will be their Elohim, and they will be my people. And when my sanctuary will be in their midst forever, the nation shall know that I, Yahweh, sanctify Israel. So, wow, this is absolutely amazing. Living in this time and seeing this happening. And one more scripture I want to go to, Isaiah 54, 1 and 2. Because as Judah came back into land, and as Yahweh's spirit has woken up the Ephraimites for the last probably 30, 40 years, and we're understanding who we are, there's one thing that hasn't happened. <laughs> Israel has not opened up their doors for the Ephraimites to come home. And why is that? Isaiah 54 says, Sing out, barren one who never bore. Break out a song and shout, you who never travailed. For the sons of the desolate one are more than the sons of the married one, says Yahweh, right? So the, the diaspora, the sons of Ephraim, are way, way bigger than the sons of Judah. And this is what Ephraim, this is what Yahweh is saying to Judah now in these last days. Make the place of your tent larger and let them stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Do not spare, lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. Why is he saying this? Because what happens? In ancient times, you know, Abraham and Sarah, they live in a tent. And as they have children, what do they do? They stretch the cord longer and they make another room on the tent. And then when Isaac has a child, then they stretch the cord longer and they make another room on the tent until you have enough room for everybody. And that's what Yahweh and that's what Ephraim is telling Israel in these end times, stretch the cord of your tent. But Israel hasn't done it. And to be honest, I've said this before, I really thought it was going to happen when so many things were happening around 2007, 2008, 2009, uh, you know, when doors were opening there. But I realize now it'll never happen through human government. Human government is corrupt, you know, and it doesn't matter where that government is, you know, the, the only way this will happen is through the kingdom of Yahweh and the return of Yeshua. So doesn't mean there won't be some people like we've been and other brethren who might be he goats before the flock who, uh, you know, Yahweh has put there you know, as representatives, you know, to show what's going to happen in the near future. But the true regathering will never happen. And I've always said this. I've always said it's a remnant that will be in the land, but the greater regathering can only happen when Yeshua returns. And that's what Scripture says. We just read it here in Ezekiel 37. But it's a shame to me and my heart breaks because if Judah would expand, you know, uh, the court of their tent, if they would just work with the Ephraim if they would let our people in there. It would only benefit them because I've seen it over and over and over. I've seen it through this ministry. I've seen it when, when nations and leaders and people and even uh, restaurants and hotels, when they bless us and our people, they're blessed by it. And the nation of Israel 
would be blessed to allow Ephraim back in there, back home, and to show what Yahweh is doing here in the end times. And it's kind of like the prodigal son, you know, you could look at it one way, because what happened? In the prodigal son, you could look at Ephraim being like the son who went out in diaspora and wasted, you know, lost his inheritance. We forgot who we were, you know, we're living among the pigs and all that stuff. And then what happens though? You know, our Heavenly Father was always there waiting for us to come home. And as we come home and we're repenting and we're trying to come back in the covenant, what happens? The other son, who could represent Judah in this case, they weren't happy. And they were mad saying, why are you, you know, looking toward this son who, who lived this way all the time? And what does the father say to Judah? He says to Judah, look, you know, the Judah's always had the Torah. They always had their identity. And he says, you'll always be with me. But your brother that was lost is now found. He's, he's come home. And that's where Judah should not be uh, afraid of us. They shouldn't be intimidated by us that somehow we're going to take away their scepter promise. The same way we don't have to worry that they're going to take away our birthright promise. Because the birthright is given to Joseph, the scepter is given to Judah through King David, and now through Messiah who owns both birthright and scepter, he's bringing us all into one. And like I said, that's why we need to look ahead to that day when Yeshua returns. We need to look ahead and be... Uh, so happy and so zealous for that day that's coming. Yahweh has a wonderful plan of redemption for all 12 tribes and the entire world. But the birthright promise and the scepter promise to the sons of Joseph and Judah will never change. And there no longer needs to be any vexation on these brothers as Messiah Yeshua has united these promises through him and to all that repent and believe through his name. So I hope you're as encouraged as I am, and Yahweh bless, Shabbat Shalom.